Hello, real life family and friends. Happy Easter. He is risen, and today we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which opened the door for all of humanity to walk out of darkness, bondage, and brokenness into a new life, a life of freedom, a life that's set free from bondage and brokenness, healed and restored, and most of all, an entry point for each and every person who will believe in Jesus Christ to be saved from eternal death and have eternal life through Him. So happy Easter to you. I hope that you are enjoying um, just the, 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 the fellowship of the presence of God in your life today. And if you're watching uh, today, uh, I just want to thank you for tuning in. And I, I've got a message for you that I hope encourages you and inspires you. You know, in our world today, I look around and there's so much chaos and brokenness and, and darkness. And uh, there's so many people on different paths that we're taking today. And there's so many different paths that people are walking on, different ways that they're choosing to live. And I think about that as kind of the, the past or these ways of living really kind of represent our pursuit or our search for significance or meaning or our identity or our purpose in life or, or just happiness in general. And so the path that we're walking on today, the path that you're on today, and the path that people are on today is a, is a search for the ultimate meaning of life. I mean, we have chosen to live a certain way or to go down a certain path because something along that path uh, has us convinced that this is the meaning of life. Right? Or this is how I find purpose. Or this is what's important to me. Or this is how I'll be happy. So there's many different paths that have been pursued. And this is the pursuit that consumes every single human being. The pursuit of what's the meaning of my life. How do I find happiness and purpose and, and, uh, and value. Right? And a lot of different paths and ways have been tried and tested. But most of these paths lead to disappointment discouragement, and even death. We don't knowingly choose a path that leads to these things. At first, the path that we choose, it, there's something about it that seems to attract us. Something seems promising. Something draws us in. Maybe it makes us initially happy or initially feels good or initially gives us a sense of value or meaning or it begins to meet our needs. But along the way, on most of these paths, we begin to see that the initial feelings wear off, that it doesn't stick. And what seemed promising to us at one point begins to fall miserably short of our hopes and our hungers for significance. And we still lack. Something's still missing. What path are you on today? Are you satisfied? Is your soul satisfied? Or is there still a lack or an emptiness or a lack of significance or direction or clarity or true purpose? Jesus makes an extraordinary claim. He says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the path that you've been searching for. All of humanity today, every single one of us, is on a certain path. There's no question about it. As I mentioned, we all are looking for our souls to be satisfied, for the meaning of life. And Jesus makes this claim, extraordinary claim. He says, I am the path. There are not many paths that lead to these, these, uh, the, the, the sense of purpose and destiny and significance and value. There's one path. There's one way. And Jesus says, it's me. I am the way. He claims that he is the way that you've been looking for. That he will lead you to the Father. And the Father, your God, is all that you've actually ever really craved. Consider this claim. When you and I are restored into relationship with God, the claim of the Bible, the claim of Jesus, is that you'll be born again that you'll be reunited in relationship with the one who made you and created you. And in this relationship, you will find 
everything that your soul has been wanting. Your purpose will be revealed. Your soul will be satisfied and your destiny will be discovered. It's all in him and through him. And Jesus claims to be the way. So consider this claim. Seriously, he is the way. No other way. He is the way that your soul will find satisfaction, that you will find life in him. And then there is truth. Let's talk about truth for a minute. Somewhere along the way, truth became susceptible to individual and personal interpretation. Suddenly we look around, excuse me, suddenly we look around and everyone feels emboldened to create or find his or her own truth. Oftentimes, uh, define logic and common sense. This individualistic approach to truth has created chaos and confusion in our world. We have conflicting truths that together are impossible to coexist. Unity is impossible under this new approach to truth in which we see our world adopting. And so Jesus makes another extraordinary, and I'll add the word, audacious claim. And he says this, he says, I am the truth. Not only am I the way, but I'm also the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. And by making this claim, he is claiming that truth is absolute and it's knowable and it is found in him and him alone. How can he make this claim? He's claiming that he is the author and creator of truth. He declares that living in his truth will set you free and will fill you with life abundant. That's his claim. His claim demands of you and I to fully embrace his truth and his truth alone and reject all other truths as lies. If anything conflicts with Jesus's truth, then it is untrue. It's a lie. That's his claim. And finally, life. There is life itself. And life is the one thing that you and I, we cannot create for ourselves. Not only can't we create it for ourselves, but we can't extend it for ourselves. We can't make life happen for ourselves. It's very clear that no amount of money <laughs> or fame or power or charisma or even motivation can help us extend our life. Our life will come to an end and we won't have anything to do about it. And so Jesus makes this final claim I want to challenge you with. And he says, I am the life. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He claims that he himself is life, that he is the one who has made us, he is the one who sustains us, and he is also the one who can give us eternal life through him. These are the claims of Jesus. And what gives Jesus the credibility for these claims? And it's simply this, today's Easter. We celebrate Easter because on this day, Jesus Christ, recognized as the Son of God, was raised from the dead. It is his resurrection that validates his claims that he alone is the way, he alone is the truth, and he alone is the life for you and for me. No other person <laughs> was raised to life and never died again. Jesus' resurrection is historical facts, uh, is a historical fact. Many witnesses, eyewitnesses and accounts and all the, you know, if you study this and, and look at the, the history of this event, uh, you will be convinced that this actually happened, that Jesus really rose from the dead appeared to many people over a long period of time, over 40, day, uh, 40 days worth of appearances. One time, it, it, the Bible says, over 500 people at one time saw him alive. He appeared to many different people at many different times. 
and it was still teaching and speaking to them before he ascended back into heaven and sent his Holy Spirit to be with us. This right here, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, validates not only his claim to be the way, the truth, and the life, but every other thing that Jesus ever taught and said and spoke. He is the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah who came and interjected himself into humanity's story to save us from our sin, to pay a debt we couldn't pay for ourselves, and to make a way back to God, and to bring us the truth, and to restore us to life. You have to contend with Jesus' claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. With his resurrection, validating these claims, you have to make a decision. Uh, C.S. Lewis used to say, uh, said this about Jesus and about the situation. He's either a lunatic, <laughs> right? He's either crazy, he's off his rocker because of the things he said and claimed, or he is who he says he is, and he is Lord. There is no room for any other position when you come to Jesus. He's either out of his mind, he's a lunatic, or he is who he says he is, he's Lord. And the resurrection proves that he is Lord. So when the gospel, this good news that we share with one another, and we remind ourselves of this gospel on Easter, when that's shared and when you hear it, you need to make a decision. There isn't any room here. He's either going to be received by you and by me into our hearts as we surrender our lives to him as Lord and we're saved, or we're rejecting that truth. We're rejecting Jesus' claim and we are going to stay lost in our sin. That's the choice that each and every one of us has. Jesus said this to, to Martha. He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. What is Jesus talking about? It sounds confusing at first. But he's saying to you and to me that if we place our faith in him, we will live even though our bodies might die because he was resurrected from the dead, so all of those who believe and trust in him will also be resurrected from the dead and be given eternal life in him. So that's why he says, whoever lives in me, uh, whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me uh, will never die after the earthly experience of death because we will have eternal life in him. Isn't that good news? That's what we're celebrating today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms that all who trust in Him, all who live in Him, will also overcome death itself and will be resurrected to eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about this. And he says this in verse 1, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living when Paul, when Paul was writing this letter, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So Paul is writing this. Of course, Paul is the one who had the Damascus Road experience where Jesus, in his resurrected form, appeared to Paul, and Paul's eyes were opened to him as Lord and Savior, and it radically changed Paul's life forever, right? And so Paul's like, Jesus is alive. This is the message that we shared with you. This is what the gospel is. The gospel is all about the fact that Jesus didn't just come and live a holy life and then die and was buried, but you have to have the resurrection because the resurrection pulls it all together and it validates that his sacrifice for you and for me was uh, 
was acceptable to God and God raised him from the dead, validating all of his teaching and all of his claims that he really is the son of God. That's why you and I, we have to contend with this. You need to decide to receive or reject Jesus as Lord. Receiving Jesus by faith results in eternal life and a new life here and now. But rejecting Jesus by not believing in him, by not receiving him, results in eternal death and suffering. Now we're talking about the one who made you, who came to save you from death due to your sin. And Jesus put it this way in John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, he says, God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, he's talking about himself, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So God's will is that none of us would perish. God's not out to get anyone. God's out to save everyone. For God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then Jesus says this, whoever believes in him is not condemned, listen to this, but whoever does not believe uh, stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. In other words, we are all sinners. We have all fallen short. We all have incurred the death penalty because of a rebellion against God, because we have gone on our own. We've become our own God in a sense. We have our own truth. We've gone our own way, and we think that life is up to us. We live life on our terms. But Jesus says, no, no, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And everybody who's off of that path is dying and is going to experience eternal death. Our sins need to be forgiven. And Jesus made a way for us to be forgiven. So he says, listen, if you believe in me, you'll be forgiven. You'll be born again. You'll be restored to life in God. But if you don't choose to believe in me, you're already condemned. He's using the story in the Old Testament where the people were complaining and rebelling against God and they were sinning against God. And so God sent some, uh, some uh, venomous snakes and then the snakes were biting the people and they were dying. And they cried out to Moses and Moses, help us. So Moses goes to God and says, God, have mercy. Have mercy on us. We've sinned. We've rebelled against you. We have sinned, but God, have mercy now. Have mercy on us. So God told Moses, put this, make this bronze serpent, put it up on a pole and lift that pole up, put that pole up high. And everybody who looks to that pole will be saved. They'll be healed. They won't die. So Moses did what he's told to do. And then Jesus is actually talking about that story right before he says these words. And he says basically the same thing. Everybody who looks to the Son of God, everybody who looks to the pole, right? And Jesus was about to go to the cross for you and for me. And it's a, it's a reference or a foreshadowing of what Jesus was about to do. So he's like, everybody who believes on me, everybody who looks to me, everybody who trusts in me will be saved, even though they've sinned, even though they, they've earned the death penalty, there is mercy and grace for everyone who will return to God through Jesus Christ and place your faith in him. And so on the cross, when Jesus died, he bled for you and for me. He paid for our sicknesses, our diseases, our hurts, our wounds, our rejection, our poverty. He paid for all of the brokenness of sin in our lives. And he paid for our death so we could be alive. So now it's up to us to trust in him, to look to him, the one who is on the pole for our salvation, for our restoration, for our life. And all who do that will be saved. But all who reject Jesus, all who choose not to trust in him, are already condemned. Jesus says, I came to seek and to save the lost. I didn't come to condemn. I didn't come to lecture. I didn't come to, you know, to, to put guilt and punishment on people. I came to save so that all who will look to him will be saved. Now today as we celebrate the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we seek to partake of the same power that raised Christ from the dead to bring life to us. The miracle of Jesus' resurrection makes a way for all other miracles to happen. And so today, I want to pray for you for a miracle in your life. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 22 says this, Paul's praying this prayer. He says, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. 
And I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and appointed him, Jesus, to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In other words, one of the main points I want to make out of that passage is this. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, Paul is saying, now lives in you and in me. The Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you and me. And as I mentioned last week, I believe in miracles. What miracle do you need from the Lord today? What miracle are you trusting for Jesus for? Hebrews 13, 8, as I mentioned last week, says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That means the same thing he was doing when he was here 2,000 years ago. He's still the same. He's doing those today. And he's going to do those next week and years from now if he tarries. He will not change. He is a miracle-working God. He loves us, and his ministry is to save. That's what Jesus does. That's his name. And like I said last week, his name, salvation, is both a noun and a verb, right? He's not only salvation, he also saves. He heals, he redeems, he sets free, right? That's what he does. And today, Jesus wants to touch you. And I'm I wanna pray for a miracle for you. So what miracle do you need from him today? Perhaps you need a miracle in your heart or in your mind. Maybe are you bound by depression or fear or grief, or hopelessness, or even suicidal thoughts? You know, is there hatred that's got you bound up? Or, or is there a destructive force in your life? Maybe an evil spirit, or an addiction, or just a, a, a you know, pride, or lust, or greed, or self-centeredness, just things that are just binding you, holding you back? Maybe you need a, to be healed from a broken heart from some trauma that you've gone through or some abuse that you've experienced or from disappointment or even maybe betrayal, some deep soul wound or hurt that has plagued you maybe for years and years. God wants to restore you. God wants to heal you. He, he wants to do a miracle in your mind, in your soul, in your body. Uh, do you need to be set free from bitterness or unforgiveness or from some hurtful curses or words that were spoken over you. Perhaps you need a miracle in your body today. Maybe you need to be healed from a sickness or a disease or an ailment. Do you need a miracle in your back or your legs, or your arms or your, your heart? Or do you have diabetes or you know, high blood pressure or some kind of condition that you're just looking for God to bring a healing to you? Perhaps you need the greatest miracle of all, salvation which I've made clear to you today is only through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you need to completely surrender your life to Christ? I want to urge you to make that decision. If you haven't completely surrendered your will to Christ, today, make that decision. You know, all real conversions to Christ happen with one first step. And that is completely surrendering your will to God. Your will, you know, saying, well, I'm going to go my way. You know, I'm going to have my truth. I'm going to dictate my life. All of that needs to die and, and merge with God's will and say, God, I am yours. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. I'm yours. I surrender my entire will and life to you today. That's placing your faith in Jesus. That's believing in Him. And that's how one is saved. 
is that you surrender your life to Christ and give it to Him. The reason why this is the greatest miracle is because salvation is promised not just for our life right now, but for life eternal, right? It's the only eternal miracle. Other miracles of healings and, and you know, being uh, uh, set free from hurts and wounds and stuff, all of that's beautiful and it's awesome, but it only lasts while we're still alive, right? Because when we have eternity upon us, all of those things are going to be perpetually healed. All of that stuff will be gone. All the tears, all the grief, all the sorrows, all the regrets, all of that stuff will be long gone in eternity. But to get to eternity, we need the miracle of salvation. So today I want to do two things. First, I want to pray a prayer. For those of you who say, I want to make sure I'm right with God today. Uh, I want to make sure that I have surrendered my whole heart to Him. And I want to be saved. I want to first pray a prayer for that. And then I want to pray for a prayer for a miracle for you today. So today, let's pray this prayer of salvation. If you're here and you're saying, I want to make sure that I have completely given my heart to Jesus. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, today, I believe in you. I wholeheartedly and completely surrender my life into your hands. I choose to follow you as the way. I choose to embrace you as the truth. And I choose to receive your life right now in your name. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sin, setting me free from all the power of sin over my life, including death, and giving me the gift of eternal life in you. I'm all yours. In your name I pray and trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now I just want to pray for you. What miracle are you needing today? It could be emotional. It could be physical. It could be a, a mental. Whatever that is. Just let's, I need you to agree that a miracle is possible. That Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus, just real quickly, just a few things that Jesus did. He healed all sicknesses and diseases. He healed the demon-possessed, the paralyzed, the lepers, the blind, the mute, the deaf, fevers, shriveled hands, people in pain and anguish. He even raised the dead. Everybody who came to Jesus and touched Jesus found a miracle, found a healing, found a deliverance. Jesus even fed thousands and thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. He did a financial miracle for Peter uh, by, by having a fish, you know, cough up some, some money. And he calmed the wind, the waves, and the storms. And he is still doing those things today. And he says, if you say to this mountain, if you believe and don't doubt, and you say to this mountain, be moved into the sea, it will be done for you. So Trust in me, believe in me, whatever you pray, whatever you ask in my name, it will be done. Nothing will be impossible to you because Jesus has made everything possible through his resurrection. And so right now, I'm just trying to build your faith that we are going to Jesus. Jesus is our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our healer. He's the resurrected one, and he's living today. And I want to just pray for you that a miracle happens. So whatever that is right now, just believe in your heart with me as I pray with you. Lord, I just pray for each person right now. Lord, we're coming together in prayer right now. We're, we're, we're joining our hearts together, believing in you. And we say, Jesus, release your power to bring about this miracle right now in my brother and my sister's life. In Jesus' name, I release that and pray, Lord, for your resurrection life right now to overflow to them, whether it's a mental breakthrough, a physical breakthrough, an emotional breakthrough, a financial breakthrough, a relational breakthrough. Right now, in Jesus' name, we just speak life to flood that area, to swallow up death, to swallow up destruction, to swallow up division, to swallow up all of those, those hurts, and for the love, the peace, the joy, and the wholeness of God to come, the shalom of God to come right now, to replace that with life, with life and fullness, 
Lord Jesus, I just pray that you'll touch my, my friend here who's watching right now and joining by faith. Touch them. Touch them, Lord, like only you can. Bring about your will in their lives. I offer them to you. I offer their concerns to you, their needs to you. Lord, you are our provider. I put them into your hands. Pray a release of heaven's will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope that you enjoy a great Easter Sunday. Hopefully you're with some family and friends. But more than anything, I'm praying that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be strong in your life, that the love of the Father will fill your hearts, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will continue to cover you every single day and throughout this day. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in his name. Amen and happy Easter.